What is up my friends, welcome back to a brand new video and today I wanted to talk about something that I'm quite passionate about and it's something I teach a lot of my students is harmonic analysis. And so what is a harmonic analysis? I mean, it, it's quite simple, true to its name. It's when you analyze a piece of music harmonically and you could usually include melody as part of this, but true to its name, harmonic analysis is really taking a look at what the composer did, getting an insight into their compositional process and kind of seeing the tendencies and instincts they have to create a piece of music from start to finish. So let's take a little bit of, uh, take a look at an overview of what harmonic analysis really is. So it really is an analysis of the musical structure and the progression of a piece of music, whether that's four to eight bars or like an entire symphony, you can really go bit by bit and kind of dissect what type of chord structures are being used to, um, you know, understand what the composer is really doing and then apply that as composers to our own music. So yeah, it gives us an insight into the composer's instincts. It also enables us to visualize common chord progressions and perhaps not so common chord progressions. Maybe you're used to a certain way of listening to, uh, you know, chords and progressions, but then you suddenly hear something that you didn't expect at all. And then you're like, okay, what is that? So then you can really go in and kind of analyze, you know, what are those things that are making this piece sound so unique? So um, also analyzing the melody can be very useful, taking a look at the shape of the melody, the intervals that make up that melody, if it has a nice contour, and uh, also the range. So basically the lowest note of the melody versus the highest note of the melody and what we can learn from that as well. So these are some things you need to know already if you do wanna analyze a piece uh, using harmonic analysis. You should understand functional harmony and be able to uh, use just the regular Roman numeral chord symbols from one to seven. You know, in the context of a major scale, we have the one, four, and five that are major, hence them being capitalized. Then the two, three, and six are traditional minor chords, and the seven is a diminished triad, okay? In minor, it's kind of the opposite. So the one and the four are minor, the five is major, depending on if it's natural or harmonic minor. Uh, the two, three, and, uh, sorry, the, the three, six, and seven are major chords, and the two is the one that is diminished. Um, you should also be aware of common chord symbols. So we call these root quality chord symbols. Uh, basically the root note, for example, C major, if you just see a C by itself, then that usually implies a major chord, so C major. And then the letter with a small M means, you know, C minor, so a small M means minor. And then C7 or C6 or whatever, that implies um, some sort of note added in that's not part of the original triad. So if it's a C7, then it's a dominant seventh. If it's a C6, then you're saying like it's a C major chord, maybe with the, the sixth note in there, uh, that type of thing. So you should be aware of, you know, basic major, minor, dominant seventh, even diminished seventh. That would be nice to know as well. Uh, you should also know what non-chord tones are, basically notes of the melody that do not belong to the chord of the moment. So for example, if you have C major chord, and you have the melody going C, D, E, then the D would naturally be the non-chord tone, right? And there's different types of non-chord tones. We have passing tones, neighbor tones, and appoggiaturas. They all mean kind of different things, uh, but you know, if you wanna explore non-chord tones a little bit more, there are plenty of resources on that, and I can cover that in a separate video if you'd like. Cadences, you know, um, perfect or authentic, half deceptive cadences, those are most common ones. You also have plagal, like four to one, but you know, authentic's five to one, so if feels like a, uh, a period or an exclamation mark. Half cadences open up the phrase, so that's like one to five or four to five. And then deceptive uh, is basically when you go from five to six. So usually we would expect the five to go to the one, but instead, instead we go to the six. So it leads us away from home a little bit more. Another very useful skill to have is building basic chords, scales, and arpeggios, right? So if you're a piano player, this is really, really useful and you'll already kind of know how to do this, but if you don't, um, you'll, you basically should know that chords you build in thirds, like C, E, G, that's how you build a C major chord. It's not C, D, E, that would be called a cluster. Scales, you know, major and minor scales, very, very common. Uh, because usually for harmonic analysis, we do this um, starting all the way back in classical, even Baroque music. And uh, nowadays you can do this for any style of music, um, especially Western styles, it's the most useful. And uh, an arpeggiation is just basically when you take a chord and break it apart and play it all the way up and all the way down, that type of thing. And I just made it out here, you know, a sufficient ability to play the piano is very helpful as well, because that really helps you um, hear what's, be what's happening. So you can write something down on the piece of paper, 
uh, while looking at the score, but then you can actually go ahead and try that out on your own, and uh, that will usually give you a sense of what the composer is doing, and it makes it a lot more useful that way. Okay, so I want to go ahead and show you an example of how I would harmonically analyze a piece of music. And I used to do this all the time. Like in my uh, theory courses when I was growing up, I specifically had courses called Harmony, History, Counterpoint, Analysis. I took all of these courses, but I, al I always loved Harmony so much because it gave me an opportunity to study what um, the, the classic composers did and um, explore different modulations, different chord types, and see how all the music works together. Uh, so yeah, it, it can be very useful as composers, especially nowadays, you know, studying the greats, um, just, just kind of see what they're doing. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll jump into a, a song that uh, is one of my favorites. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at Over the Rainbow, one of my favorite songs out there. Uh, I love musical theater. You know, I love to write Disney type of music. So uh, music like this always gets me in my heartstrings, especially because it's not just strict major and minor chords. There are also non excuse me, non-diatonic chords like secondary dominants and, you know, jazz chords in there with really cool extensions and all that. But let's take a classical approach to harmonic analysis and see what we can come up with. So the first thing we need to do is analyze what key we are in because that will give us a center to build our functional chord symbols around. We could say the one chord, but if we don't know what key we're in, then it, it becomes a little dodgy. So just by looking at the key signature, we can already tell that we are in the key of either C major or a minor, knowing that neither of those keys have any sharps and flats in them. So one really fast way to tell whether it, you're in the major or the relative minor is you want to take a look at the very beginning of your piece of music and look in the left hand. Okay, usually that's going to be in the bass clef. Usually now, now here we have in treble clef, but it doesn't really matter. The reason why we do this is because the beginning of the piece of music will usually start on the tonic or on the one chord of the scale. So in this case, if it's C major, then we would expect the left hand to play a C because usually the left hand plays harmony, right? So in this case, we take a look and yes, we have a middle C. So this tells me, it gives me a really good clue that I'm in the key of C. One other thing you can do is look at the end of the song and it should also end in the same key or on the same chord. Right? So in this case, we look at the very end in the left hand and voila, we have another middle C. So that tells us that we start and end the song on C major. So that's really nice. And that's one of the reasons why songs that do this feel very complete and very comfortable is because they start and end in the exact same position, basically. They start on the one chord and end on the one chord, okay? So that's the first step. We know it's in C major. This might be good to write down. Let's do that. So I'm going to say, wow, that is very bright. Okay, let me, let's, let's make that red so we can clearly see this. C major, make it much smaller. I don't know why it's so huge. Sorry about that. Let's do, okay, fine. Let's do that. Um, now we can actually start analyzing the chords, okay? Because we want to see what the composer, uh, Harold Arlen, uh, arranged by Dan Coates, what, what, what really happens here to give us a sense of, you know this this beautiful nostalgic feeling so let me just play the intro for you and we'll get we'll, we'll get started and if i just end there then you can hear that it's asking a question whereas i started and it sounded like it's starting at home right it's the start of a story I apologize, it was slightly off time there. My, my, my piano is just a little bit laggy right now. So forgive me if it's a little bit off time, my playing there. Anyway, let's get started. So we know it's in, uh, it's, we know it's in C and we know it starts on the C here, but are we actually playing the C major chord? Well, let's take a look. In the left hand, we have a C, we have a G and we have an A here, okay? And the C and the G can already apply Im imply a C major chord, but this A here is almost implying like a C6 of some sort. So it's like we have the C major chord, but we're adding in the sixth note of the scale. In this case, let's actually keep it simple. Let's treat the A as kind of a non-chord tone. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, I wanna make sure this is not bolded. I'm gonna make this a lot smaller, let's say 50. Yeah, okay, you know what, let's go with 40. And um, I'm just gonna put I there to imply the one chord, okay? Let's put that kind of there. Well, let's, okay, we'll cross it with a pedal, okay? And uh, the, the, the fact that I'm saying it's the one chord is kind of reinforced by the right hand. You see how we have an E and a G here in the right hand. So I know C, E, G, that tells me that I have the one chord here, 
Okay, and this carry, carries on for the entire bar. Usually songs will have one chord per bar or maybe two chords per bar if it's a little more complicated, but classical music can go even more complicated than that and go up to like four or five chords in a single bar, but we're staying simple here today. Okay, so that's the one chord. Now we take a look at the next bar, which sounds like this. Okay. Now this is really interesting because we still have the C on the bottom. We have a G here, so it could be the C major chord, but now I have a B, right? And that's like, okay, that's kind of out of place. We don't usually expect that B because it doesn't belong in the regular C major triad. So let's look to the right hand for some information. Here we have F and we have a G. Now what chord in C major has both F and G in it? Can the F belong to the G in some way? Well, to me, this implies a sort of dominant seventh chord. So here I'm hearing the G and the F as being part of the G7 chord or G dominant seven or G7, you can call it. So let me open Chordy app here so we can kind of see what's happening. Um, and yeah, I'll just kind of put it up here or maybe down here, there we go. Yeah, so this is the chord here. And so the second right here, the if I just play this, it's calling it a C major seven plus four, but if I take away the C on the bottom, what do we get? We actually get a G seven. So what I think this chord is, as I think this is actually the five seven chord, but with the C pedal going along for the first three bars. When I say pedal, I just mean it's the, it's the bottom note that's being carried throughout different bars and the chord above is, is changing basically. So what we have here is we have the one chord to start with and then what, what I'm gonna say is it's the five seven chord and I'm gonna say with a C pedal, okay? Just like that. Make this a touch smaller here. Um, maybe move this up a little bit, there we go. Okay, and, uh, and then so yeah, that's the five seven chord and then what happens here? We have, okay, so now we have the C we have the G, we have the A, and we have the uh, yeah we have we basically have all the notes of C major, but we also have the A in the top as well. So we would call this a C major six. In this case, you could just put the one chord, and uh, if you want to, you could just put a little six there just to you know imply that it's a major chord with a six as well. Okay, you could also put add six if you want to use kind of like jazz terminology there. But essentially we have, you know, the one chord going to the five chord, but with a C pedal, because C is still on the bottom. And then we have the one chord again, uh, because the A is really being stressed here in this bar, right? Then the next bar, we have G and F in the left hand over here. And then here in the right hand, we have G, D, and F. So this, all these notes still belong to the G7 chord. Right, and then the very last bit of the bar, it's going back to the five chord again. So this whole bar is basically five seven. So let's write this down. It's basically just five seven, just like that. And the seven is because why? We have the F natural right there. That's the, the, the minor seventh note above the G. That's actually being played right here in the thumb, left thumb right there. Okay, let's move on. So somewhere over the rainbow, let's play that a little bit. a little question there. We also have, you know, chord symbols here above, but we'll just, you know, not really look at those for now. We'll just analyze this as if they're not there. Anyway, we start with C again here. So that tells me that most likely it's going to be the one chord. I can always double check and say, um, we have C, we have, oops, sorry, we have C, G, C, we have another C here. So most likely we're going to start off somewhere, probably going to start at home on the one chord. But now we go, so that's A and E, and what chord could that be? It could be A major, it could be A minor. Well, we know in, a, in C major, the sixth chord, of or A, is minor. So we take a look at the right hand, we have E and C, which creates an A minor chord. So what I'm gonna do here is write um, VI, make sure it's lowercase because it, it is a minor chord. So there's our functional chord symbol for this second chord here. Then we continue on, we look at the next bar, we look at this chord here. So we have 
E, B, G, B. What does that create? It creates an A, E minor chord, which is the three chord in C major. So I go over, oh, I, I, I. Let's make sure that it, uh, that it fits properly, okay? Um, and then the right hand kind of changes notes here, but harmonically it doesn't really change anything. So this F sharp and the A would just be called passing tones because we're literally passing from one chord tone to another chord tone. And in between we have these non-chord tones that bridge the two chord tones. So we would call these passing tones, non-chord tones, okay? Then here at the very end of the bar, we have C7. And why do we have a dominant seventh that has a B flat in it? Because it's probably implying the F major scale, right? Because you know when we have secondary dominance, we're treating, uh, you know, the root of this chord, the C, as the temporary dominant of a new tonic. So if C is the dominant, what would the tonic be? If C is the fifth note of the scale, what would the first note be? That would be F major or F minor, but in this case F major because F major belongs in C major. So if we look at the next chord, we do get an F major chord, right? So what we're going to do here is we're actually going to write. This is the five seven because it is a dominant seventh, but it's not the dominant seventh of the original key of C because that would be a G seven, like over here, G seven. Um, it's actually the five seven of the four chord, right? And the four chord is F. So after that, we get the four chord. And this is very common. You'll usually see the five seven of whatever it is, five seven of four, for example, will be followed by the four or whatever the second chord is. So that's how you notate a secondary dominant or apply dominant. You say the chord quality or the functional chord symbol slash, so of, five, seven, of, four. Hope that makes sense. Okay. Continuing on here, we have the F major chord. Then we have, we kind of have this E, C, A, which creates an A minor chord in second inversion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say it's the sixth chord, but it is, um, it is in second inversion, so I'm going to say it's 6-4. That's how you notate it. Um, so the chord symbol, the functional chord symbol, the Roman numeral, 6-4, okay? I would call this D-sharp a neighbor tone. So it's a non-chord tone, but it's a neighbor tone because I'm starting from E, I'm going to, uh, you know, away from that chord tone, but I'm going back to the original chord tone. So whether it goes up a step, then back down, or it goes down a step and back up to the original note, you call that a neighbor tone because it doesn't belong to that chord of the moment. Okay, moving on. Here, I'm gonna say it's the one chord. Actually, it's the one six, because it's in, um, it's in first inversion, because E is on the bottom. And the chord here, here I have basically the C major chord over E. And for me, this D is, um, it's, it's, it's an appoggiatura. It's basically a chord that doesn't, uh, sorry, it's a chord tone, a non-chord tone that doesn't belong to the chord, right? There we have. Okay, now this B flat really sounds like it fits. And again, here is our C7 chord. So that tells me that it's another secondary dominant. And again, as we saw before, especially here, we have the dominant seventh of the four chord followed by the four chord. As you can see here, we have the F major chord because we have F on the bottom, we have C, we have A in the right hand. So F, C, A creates an F major chord. So that's the four chord. Then we have a D diminished chord, or you could say it's an F minor chord. So I agree with that. I think an F minor chord would work really well here. But this D over here created a twinge of sadness. So I could call this a D diminished chord uh, which would be like the, the diminished seventh of the E chord. In this, course, in, in this case, it makes more sense for it to be an F minor chord. So we take the four chord, but we uh, make it minor because of that A flat over there. Very, very common in Broadway, musical theater, Disney, um, to borrow from the parallel minor if you're in the major key. Cool. Then we have, let's see, this is going to be one, six, four, because I have the C major chord here, but it's over G, which is the, the uh, second inversion chord. So we notate that as six, four. Now here, if, if you just take a look, right, if I just play this chord on the word heard, it says it's an A7 flat nine. What is the flat nine note? It's the B flat. So I take that out and now you get 
just a regular A7 chord. So that B flat is a non chord tone. And so again, we have a secondary dominant because we have this C sharp, they call it a D flat, it's actually a C sharp. But we have this chord tone in there. And if A is the tonic, sorry, if A is the dominant note, what would the tonic be? Well, it would be one, two, three, four, five, and that would be D. Do we get a D chord after? We do, D7, right? So we're introducing the C sharp into the key of C major for a moment. And so this is the dominant seventh chord, but of D. So D is the second note of the C scale. So that's why I put five, seven of two. Then we go on here and D7 is going to be the five, seven of the five chord because in C major, the five chord is G and the dominant seventh of G is D. So that's what we get here, right here, D7. Once in a la, la. Now we basically get to go back home through the regular dominant seventh of the scale. So I can put five, seven, right? And then, so this is basically a series of uh, dominant sevenths. It's like a dominant seventh chain, which is really nice. Two, five, one, and then the real one lands here. So then we can say this is the one chord. There's no inversion because the bottom note is a C. Um, and then after that, so it goes I. Then here, that's like the two chord because it's a D minor, D, F. There's no A there, but that's okay. So I'm gonna put the two chord there. Stretch that out just a little bit. There we go. And also the G7, right? Because we have a G on the bottom when we have an F in the top in the right hand, that implies a G, F. So that has a kind of a minor seventh, dominant seventh sound to it. So here we're gonna put five, seven again. It's really small. Okay, there we go. And then this goes back into a re the repeat of the, the, uh, the verse again, somewhere over the rainbow. And so this is how I would basically go through and analyze it. And I didn't analyze the melody here, but you get a sense of how the chord structure works together. It makes a lot of sense. You know, we start with the one chord, you start at home, you kind of go away from home for a second. So you, then you go back home, back to one, go away from home again, go to the five chord. Then when the word starts somewhere, you want to make sure you start at home. Then on somewhere, you're going quite far, right? You're going from the one all the way up to the six chord. And then you go to the three chord, which is another tonic function. Now you explore a secondary dominant, which resolves to the four chord. So that is the first non-diatonic chord we have here, which is beautiful. And, uh, and then we have the six chord back to the one chord, uh, another secondary dominance to the four again, minor four borrowing from the parallel minor. That's, this is a minor, uh, minor plagal cadence, you know, four back to one, minor four to one, then a chain of secondary dominance resolving back to one at the end. So this is where you can get really inventive with the harmony, right? And it's really beautiful because you can really build secondary dominance on any scale degree other than the one. And I think this is done very effectively here. So let's play this through once you, so you can get a, a feeling of what this whole first page sounds like. Again, I apologize in advance for any, you know, lagging behind or anything. It's just a little bit laggy here, but let me give it a shot. And then it just continues on from there. But you get the idea, right? So anytime we get to the one chord, the three chord, or the six chord, you feel slightly resolved, you know? When you get to the five chord, when you get to a secondary dominant, when you get to any type of chord that has a dominant function, be usually being the five or the seven chord, it has to resolve somewhere. And so you always get that resolution that follows that tension, which is one of the reasons I love Broadway and musical theater, Disney music so much is because 
whenever you explore and go out of the diatonic key for a moment, like the regular major or minor key, you always come back, whether that's one chord later or maybe a series of chords later, it always comes back home. So it always gives us a resolved and comfortable feeling, which we don't always get in more experimental styles of music. So I think, I think uh, music that sticks closer to classical tradition, but has room to explore non-diatonic chords and you know, that type of thing is my favorite style of music because it's not, it's not hundred percent predictable, but you always kind of deep down know what to expect because eventually, you know, you will come back home. Anyway, that, <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of talking, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of notes about harmonic analysis, but you can, you can see how useful it eventually is, right? Especially as a composer, as a songwriter, if you're trying to analyze the, the great, pieces out there the 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 standards that stand the test of time um it's just really nice to see how people relate to them emotionally and while they might not be able to always explain why it makes them feel so good and so you know happy you know as musicians we should at least be able to kind of say okay you know here is where it feels like we're coming back home here's where it feels like it's it's exploring more interesting harmony you know, things like that. And uh, this is just one interesting example where you can you can take a look and see, okay, it's not just diatonic chords, but we also have non-diatonic chords in there with a the secondary dominance and things like that. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope this made sense. You know, uh, I love harmonic analysis and I, I hope you did too. But I think theory is a lot of fun when you really uh, understand the basics, you know? And uh, just as a, my gift to you for watching this video, I actually have a guide all about the fundamentals of music theory that I think is really, really important to know. So if you're interested in really getting down and drilling down to the basics, I just wanna recommend that guide to you absolutely free. Um, hopefully it serves as a refresher to you if you just wanna you know, fill in any holes when it comes to theory. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I just it's just my gift to you for watching this video all the way through and, uh, and for taking the time to go on this journey with me. So thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll catch you in the next video, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.